Today we're going to be talking about the connection between stress, adrenals, low blood sugar, low blood pressure. This is a common theme that I hear from a lot of the people that I work with. Uh, and it, doctors that they go to don't seem to have answers for them or they're being put on medications or they're having to spend the time themselves 90% of the time looking online to get solutions and they're not seeing anything on the internet that tells them about hey how are your adrenals related to blood pressure or how is it related to blood sugar and most importantly what can I do about it so that we're gonna be talking about the connection be between stress the adrenals low blood pressure and low blood sugar. So let me ask you first, does this sound like you? Does this sound like you have, sorry, just make sure you get everything in here. Does this make it, does it sound like you? Do you have no energy? You get tired really, really easily. You have no stress tolerance. So a lot of people will tell me, I can't, I can't watch the news or I just can't read emails, or even if I'm watching a TV show, I don't do well, or when my children tell me about their health challenges, or about their grades, or they talk back to me, or they have no respect or discipline, or they just are so unbearable and sensitive and irritable, I can't tolerate that. It puts me into overwhelm and I have to lay down. Um, maybe you stand up and you get very faintish, like you're gonna pass out or you get fainting spells or dizziness or you feel like your heart's racing and it's gonna beat through your chest or you get shaky or jittery or you quit crave sweets uh, during the day or you get irritable if you miss a meal or you feel like you have to have several meals throughout the day so that your blood sugar doesn't plummet or you feel like you have to depend on caffeine or coffee to be able to get started or in the middle of, of the afternoon when you're hitting that lull or that 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. midday crash, you need another pick-me-up or you get lightheaded if you miss meals. If that sounds like you, then this is going to be a really informative lecture because that is significant for people that have low blood sugar, they have problems with their, their blood pressure, they don't deal with stress very well, they understand that there's a fatigue component and they're looking for answers. So really, we're gonna be talking about the connection between, between stress, between your adrenals, between low blood pressure and low blood sugar. So what are, we, what are the topics that I, I have outlined for you today? So today I wanna to talk to you about the new definition for adrenal fatigue. I have a website, it's called The Truth About Adrenal Fatigue. I've suffered with my own adrenal fatigue problem. I know how it feels to be not validated, to be insulted, to be told there's no such thing, to be looked at like you're crazy, to be dismissed, to be able to be passed off, to be able to be told to just take medication, antidepressants, you're depressed. And, and so many people that I talk to tell me, no, I'm not depressed, I'm happy, something's wrong, something's not working in my body. We're gonna be talking about how mast cells stimulate the HPA axis. That's a big difference that a lot of doctors don't even know about. And it's, you know, they say in the research, when a published study comes out, that that's 17 years in the making, or it takes 17 years before it's implemented, before the, it's accepted, before the flat world people say, oh, really the world might actually be round. That's the analogy I would use. I wanna talk about the role of histamine. I wanna talk about the role of the RAAS system, the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, because that's why you have low blood pressure. That's, because, that's why you're peeing a lot. That's why your potassium is very low, and your doctors don't know why, and we're gonna connect the dots today. Today we're gonna to talk about the relationship between cortisol and blood sugar stability. Why doesn't my, doc, my doctor know about this, and how to combat this? So let's start with, why doesn't my doctor know about this? Well, this is brand new stuff, like I said, where Dr. Theo Hardy's from Tuft University has shown uh, in, like, conclusively that mast cells, which is basically your immune system, your white blood cells, they stimulate your HPA axis or your hypothalamus, which stimulate your pituitary, which stimulate your adrenals. So the old, the old adage of doing a saliva test, in my opinion, is, is too outdated. I do Dutch tests, but they are in, in relationship to all the other clinical pictures. 
and the old adage of just take something to boost your cortisol or take something to lower your cortisol is not gonna work when your mast cells are stimulating your HPA axis. It's not gonna do anything for the mast cells. Um, so why should you listen to me? Well, I've suffered with my own adren adrenal fatigue problem. I was over $250,000 of student debt. I was drinking lots of caffeine, lots of sugary foods, having a lot of tremendous stress from studying and late night and um, exams and finals and the pressure of paying bills, the pressure of being a new father of twins, the pressure of living in a new country, let alone a new state, the pressure of paying back loans, the pressure of opening up a business. I've dealt with stress and to be dismissed by a doctor and say, hey, your blood tests are normal, there's no such thing as adrenal fatigue, that you, we don't believe you, you're just a difficult client, um, please get out of my office in not so many which names or, or, or ways that they're saying that, go see someone else, just need to relax. I mean, how many of you have heard that before? It's very, very frustrating. Uh, as far as the site that I have is called The Truth About Adrenal Fatigue, because really the truth is it goes deeper than the HPA axis. You should also listen to me because I actually give a damn. I care about you getting better. What makes my day is to hear about how you're coming home and you're able to spend more time with your daughter. You're able to go for a bike ride. You're able to fall asleep, stay asleep, wake up feeling recharged. You're, you're grateful for your life. You have a renewed, ass, uh, renewed invigoration for life. And most importantly, you pay that forward to help other people in your life. Because if I can help you help other people, then I can help more people. And I'm willing to be your advocate. I'm willing to put the arrow on my back and say, hey, I got you. You don't have to take over the steering wheel. I know you're spending a boatload of time researching this and, and no one's telling you the truth. No one is getting to the root of the problem. And not just one thing. Like that's the thing I think you need to understand is it's not a needle in the haystack. It's not just one root problem. It's, it's a whole bunch of things. It's life, it's environment. It's the perfect storm of the environment loading the, um, pulling the trigger, trigger if you will, and, and overlapping with your genetic susceptibilities. We do a lot of genetic testing and genetics haven't changed, but what has changed is the environment has changed and it's causing the loaded gun to go off in so many different places that's impacting your mast cells, that's impacting your HPA axis, that's impacting your cortisol, that's impacting your blood sugar and your blood pressure. Does that, does that make sense? And hopefully it does make sense. So let's talk about the truth about adrenal fatigue. The truth about adrenal fatigue is it's a crappy name. It really is a crappy name. Uh, a, a lot of people like to use HPA axis dysfunction, which stands for the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenals dysfunction. And to me, that's not enough either. That's not covering exactly what's going on. It's a stress response. Our body is designed to deal with stress and we have so many stressors more than our body can deal with. And ultimately your body makes priorities. And I always tell people, look, you have an imbalance between supply and demand. Your demand for stress response is much higher than your supply for stress response. And in life, if your demand for um, bills is high and your supply to pay the bills is low, you're gonna have a lot of problems. You're not gonna pay the basics and may even not pay, uh, or you're not gonna pay the luxury items for sure. You're not going on vacations, you're not going out for dinner, you're not buying new shoes, you're not buying another car. You're just keeping the lights on. And when your demand and supply in your body physiologically is the same, in balance, there's too much demand for not enough supply, what's gonna happen is your body's gonna prioritize. And in a lot of ways, the same things that are stressing the demands that are stressing your body are going to deplete your resources that allow your blood pressure to be maintained. And when it gets that deep, we call that pot syndrome, where you stand up, you get lightheaded, your blood pressure doesn't accumulate, your temperature accommodate, your temperature doesn't rise if it's cold out and, and you need the temperature to go up, or vice versa, if it's really hot, your temperature doesn't go down. You're not able to regulate your, your blood pressure, your heart rate, your respiratory rate. You get shaky, you get lightheaded. There's a blood sugar component. You overstimulate yourself when you go for a drive. You have a panic attack. All of these things are not, you're not crazy. Physiologically, these are going on and no one's telling you about that. 
So I want to talk to you about mast cells and how they stimulate the HPA axis. So again, doctors can watch this video and say, I've never heard that mast cells stimulate the HPA axis. I would urge them to go to the PubMed journals, research Dr. Theo Hardy's from Tufts University. He works a lot with autistic kids and spectrum disorder kids and neurodegenerative conditions. And he's proved that mast cells stimulate the HPA axis. So if we are just working on cortisol and, and increasing our cortisol, like licorice root, even hydrocortisone, it drives me crazy that doctors give prednisone because that's just way too high, or medro dose packs. They have their time and place, not, not prednisone. Um, but if you're not getting rid of the stimulus, then you're just, what I tell people, getting a cup and pouring water out of a boat that has a hole in it. And at some point, you're not gonna keep up and you're gonna drown, and I'm sure you're feeling that way. But look at what also stimulates the HPA axis. Stress, stress stimulates the HPA axis and stress stimulates your mast cells. So my mentor talks about how the, this is a 3D chess game played underwater. And it really is, because there's so many, this causes that, but that causes this, which causes those, which back, come back around and cause this. And it, it really becomes chasing your tail and playing whack-a-mole if you're looking at your thyroid and you're saying, hey, my, my, my TSH is, is low or my T4 is low, but then my T3 is fine and you're micromanaging and you're not getting better. It's because you're playing downstream. You're not upstream enough to be able to fix that. So that's really, really important. So I want to show you this diagram. So first and foremost, you could walk away with this and say, okay, I don't have necessarily an adrenal fatigue problem. It's a terrible name. Um, Dr. Rosen also says that HPA axis doesn't cover it enough. What you can talk, say is you have a mast cell activation problem. Now, doctors will say to you, no, you don't have a mast cell activation problem and because they look at black and white. And I would say, okay, I can accept that. I have a continuum. I have a mild form of mast cell activation. And here's the test that you can do to prove that. And I learned that from Dr. Rosen. So anyways, um, but what I wanna show you is the bigger picture is mast cells have all of these things and more that stimulate it. So mold, mold is a beast. Mold will stimulate mast cells. Lyme disease will stimulate mast cells. EMFs will stimulate mast cells. Things that you're getting in your um, bovine growth hormone, dairy, proteins, um, pesticides and sprays. I mean, our environment, unfortunately, aluminums and heavy metals, uh, oxalates and histamines, all of these things, viruses, stress, EMFs, dopamine, so me being addicted to my phone and I need a signal to tell me someone responded to a text message or someone liked the post or I just got an email. All of that is stimulating your mast cells, which is stimulating your HPA axis. Hopefully that makes a lot of sense to you. So that's the other thing I wanted to teach you. And now I want to teach you the role of histamine. So what does histamine have to do this with this? Well, histamine is a consequence of mast cell activation. So if you have all these environmental triggers that are stimulating your mast cells, which is a good thing, you want your mast cells, which is basically a branch of the immune system, the branch of your defense units to mount a defense against pathogens and harmful environmental things. You just don't want them there 24 seven. And so what happens is mast cells will stimulate histamine. Histamine is as if I cut my finger, it swells up and gets red. That's an immune response. We don't want that all the time either. But classical histamine symptoms would be things like itchiness, watery eyes, runny nose, allergens, cats, pets, danders, pollens. Uh, sometimes people have a lot of histamine reactions to alcohol or fermented foods or foods that are left over. But that's classical. You don't have to have that and you could still have histamine issues. You have multiple food sensitivities. You're not able to calm down. You have low blood pressure, low blood sugar. It's impacting your HPA axis. One thing I wanna teach you is cortisol has to be released to tame histamine. So if you have a lot of histamine, I have a lot of histamine challenges and cortisol has to be released to be able to tame that. And I have a problem with making cortisol from, from cholesterol and, and pregnenolone. So there's a lot of moving parts. You may look at your adrenal test and it looks normal, but you have all of these other things that are going on. You're not crazy. You're not getting the answers you're looking for. So what does this have to do with the renin-angiotensin system? And what does this have to do with, with your blood pressure? 
Well, renin, the renin-angiotensin system is a hormone system within the body that's essential for regulating your blood pressure and your fluid balance. The system is mainly comprised of three hormones, renin, angiotensin II, and aldosterone. And it primarily, primarily regulates the rate of renal blood flow. And the adrenals are called the suprarenals. They sit on top of the kidneys. So they have to do with stress, inflammation control, fluid balance, uh, blood pressure, uh, in, uh, immune reactions, blood sugar balance. All of these things are going to um, fall at the wayside as a consequence of all the things upstream. And if you're not playing upstream and you keep, like the analogy I've used many times is if you have a polluted pond or a polluted river in your backyard and you just cleaned that area but didn't get to the source of the runoff of the contamination, you're gonna continue to have to clean that area because you're not getting to the cause of that problem. And so that's what ultimately happens. But what I wanna show you is when you have histamine reactions, it comes back down around and stimulates that renin angiotensin system, which is gonna cause blood pressure imbalances, fluid imbalances, potassium depletion, high, could cause high blood pressure. That's the 3D chess game played underwater is you can have the same pathology with, um, or, or different pathology, like you can have um, high, high histamine or low histamine and it can create the same symptoms. Because it just depends on, I tell people, you take a picture, throw a ball in the air. If you take it right away, the ball's still climbing. If you take it as the ball falls, the ball hits the ground. So what that means is it becomes very complicated because low insulin, high insulin can create the same symptoms or low histamine, high histamine can create the same symptoms. You want a Cinderella zone. But the bottom line is histamine comes back around, feeds forward that renin-angiotensin system, causes your fluid balance your blood pressure over time to lower. And then a lot of doctors don't even know about this. And they say, hey, Mary, your blood pressure is great, 80 over 60, that's awesome. But you're not doing anything for it. You're burnt out. You have mast cell activation, HPA axis dysfunction, too much histamine, too much feed forwarding on your aldosterone system. And you're taking adrenal adaptogens and you're not moving the needle. I see that every day. It's very, very frustrating. Um, and then the big picture really is Here's the HPA axis, here's the mast cells, it stimulates cortisol, mast cells stimulate histamine, cortisol has to be released to tame histamine, histamine comes back around and it does it all over again. And that's what you're not being told. Doctors do not know this. So what does this have to do with blood sugar stability? Well, when cortisol is being pulled in so many directions, one of the main functions of cortisol is it's very catabolic. So what it does is it helps to break down stored glycogen as a fuel, as a ready available fuel source. So if your cortisol is being tugged in so many directions and you have HPA axis dysfunction, it's gonna impact the metabolism or the way that you regulate your blood sugar. So you may feel like you're shaky, you're lightheaded, you're jittery, but in effect, you may not actually have low blood sugar unless you actually test your glucose. Many of the clients that I work with, when we test your glucose, we actually find that it's very high. And they're like, that doesn't make sense. I, I feel shaky, lightheaded, and jittery. I need to eat every couple hours. That's because you're insulin resistant, where your blood sugar, your cortisol, your stress levels, your HPA axis, your mast cells, your histamine, your renin-angiotensin system, they're going haywire. They're causing inflammation. You're not able to because mast cells are inflammation, that drives up your insulin. Your insulin drives up your insulin resistance. You're not getting glucose into the cell. You feel hypoglycemic, but in your blood sugar levels, you're hyperglycemic, and you're making it worse by eating every couple hours. Does that make sense? I mean, hopefully that makes sense. It makes me so frustrated that this is not being taught. Um, and I would say, are you actually testing your blood sugar levels? Mm -hmm. The two tests that I would recommend you do is get a continual glucose monitor. And you've heard this from me first, where that's going to be something that you'll see on everyone in the future to be able to monitor their glucose. We're already doing that. And then on top of that, fasting insulin. People are not testing their fasting insulin. And they say, hey, my A1C is okay. My glucose is okay. But then they don't test your fasting insulin and you see your fasting insulin is high, that's gonna stimulate mast cells. That's gonna stimulate your HPA axis. That's gonna stimulate histamine. That's gonna stimulate uh, your renin-angiotensin system. So hopefully this is starting to make sense for you. So the question comes down to how do I combat this? 
Well, you need to understand the truth about adrenal fatigue. It goes deeper than the adrenals. It's not you have low cortisol, take something to boost it. You have high cortisol, take something to lower it. It's about getting to the root cause of the problem, which is ultimately what's unique in your body that's stimulating your mast cells. What are the environmental triggers and what are your genetic susceptibilities and how are they playing with each other? You need to know all those factors. You also need to get a genetic test. I mean, I've told this over and over and over again. You need not only a proper genetic test, someone to interpret that genetic test. You need to test your glucose real time with a continual glucose monitor or a glucose ketone index marker, um, or which is basically a machine that can take your glucose, then you use another strip, it tastes your, your ketones, and then you look at those ratios to each other. And you need fasting insulin. And then lastly, you need to understand healing is a verb. Healing's a verb. It's not something you do one time. I say over and over again, you could have someone that goes for a gastric bypass and they lose weight, but then all of a sudden they start eating more foods, eat crappier foods, they're not as active, they don't have a good mindset, they are, are not, they're not maintaining what they did initially to get there. I always love the commercials for medications and they'll say, hey, along with a, a proper diet and, and an exercise program, this medication has been shown to be effective. I, I would love to say, yeah, along with a proper diet and, and an exercise program without this medication, those have proven to be effective too. Um, but healing is a verb and it's gonna take time um, you need to identify what are the challenges specifically so you're not throwing crap at the wall and hoping what sticks, but you're doing a precise approach where you're looking at what is stimulating the HPA axis, what's stimulating your cortisol production, how is it impacting my blood glucose, how is it impacting my, my blood pressure, what is my blood glucose, and be able to customize a recovery strategy around that.